Let's conclude our examination of the Morissette approach used to construe federal criminal statutes. In the case of Staples versus the United States, the defendant was convicted at trial on a charge of possession of an unregistered firearm, the word firearm in scare quotes. Firearm is a technical term defined in the statute under which Staples was charged. Under the definition, firearm is synonymous with the more familiar terms fully automatic assault rifle or machine gun. A firearm under this definition is any weapon capable of discharging multiple rounds on a single squeeze of the trigger. Firing in a matter of seconds, perhaps as many rounds as its magazine can hold. A firearm so defined is obviously more deadly than a semi-automatic assault rifle, which needs a discrete pull of the trigger for each round to fire. The difference can be spectacular. You may remember that in Las Vegas in 2017, Stephen Paddock killed 60 people and wounded hundreds more by firing from the windows of his room in the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Pollard used a device called a bump stock to enable his arsenal of semi-automatics to fire automatically. Pollard, of course, knew what his guns could do. Staples, however, claims that he did not. He wants the jury to take this into account, and his counsel asked the trial court so to instruct the jury. The trial judge refused to do so. On appeal, the defendant asserts it was error for the trial court to refuse to instruct the jury that the U.S. must show the defendant had knowledge that the rifle he possessed was capable of firing fully automatically. Well, let's take a look at the statute. It shall be unlawful for any person to receive or possess a firearm which is not registered to him in the National Firearms Registration and Transfer Record. The statute goes on to say that possession of an unregistered firearm is punishable by up to 10 years imprisonment. Parenthetically, why does the government not let Staples register his firearm after the fact? I'll send you to your breakout rooms to work this one out. The policy is to confiscate, not to register firearms. Anyway, I see no culpability language here. Having to prove knowledge of automatic capability will make it significantly more difficult to deter possession of automatic weapons. The ultimate question is, what did Congress intend? The prosecution analogizes to the court's precedents. In United States v. Doderick, for example, the court affirmed a criminal conviction of a pharmaceutical executive whose firm had transported misbranded drugs in interstate commerce. It is convenient, but misleading, to speak of the statute in cases like Doderick as strict liability offenses. I encourage you to take care. There is no question that the prosecution had to show that the defendant knew he was transporting something and that he knew that what he was transporting was drugs. In Doderick, the court held that the prosecution did not have the additional burden of showing the defendant knew or even had reason to know that the drugs in an interstate shipment were misbranded. The defendant stood in a responsible relation to a substance that was hazardous to public health if misbranded. And so Congress chose to throw upon such persons the risk that what they shipped was mislabeled. Of course, it had to be shown that the defendant knew he was in that position of responsibility. Think of this variation. The defendant is on vacation when he gets the news. He has gotten a promotion and transfer. How long has he been in a responsible relation to interstate shipments? Longer than he knew. But surely he takes the risk of misbranded shipments only after he becomes aware that he is in that responsible relationship. If we had in our head that this was a strict liability offense, we could have overlooked this. So I encourage you to say strict liability element and don't say strict liability offense. 
back to Staples. We are dealing with a federal criminal statute containing no applicable culpability language, so Morissette dictates our approach. Is the statute a public welfare offense, as in Doderick, Freed, and other cases, or is it an infamous crime? The statute is lately enacted. It addresses conduct that is not malum in se. There's nothing wrong with possessing a machine gun, per se, is there? And the statute addresses risk creation rather than actual harm. Looks like a public welfare offense so far. The court lays emphasis on the fact that the statute, lacking a culpability requirement, would criminalize apparently innocent conduct, as if that were not also true of owning what was known to be a fully automatic weapon. The crusher, though, is the fact that the offense is a felony. That seems to settle it. As if announcing a bright line rule, the court indicates that the firearm statute is to be treated as an infamous crime, and therefore a culpability requirement is to be read in. The court chooses knowledge rather than, as under the model penal code, mere recklessness. What if Congress were to amend the statute to make the offense a mere misdemeanor? Would the court read in culpability in that case? It doesn't say. And we really can't easily say what the outcome would be under a Morissette analysis. Where the federal offense is not a felony, we lack a bright line rule and must balance the factors. For the sake of completeness, there's something you should be told about the Model Penal Code. The Model Penal Code tells us to read in culpability if culpability is not specified in the statute. But it makes an exception, except as provided in Section 205. Let's hustle over and have a look at this exception. The requirements of culpability prescribed by sections 2.01 and 2.02 do not apply to offenses which constitute violations. Violations. Default, no need to read culpability into violations. Okay, but what are violations? Let's look. An offense constitutes a violation if it is so designated or if no other sentence than a fine or a fine and forfeiture or other civil penalty is authorized. In other words, no jail time for violations. So the complete model penal code framework distinguishes violations from crimes and attaches the same significance to that distinction as Morissette does to public welfare offenses and infamous crimes. The generic term is offenses, which divide into the two species, crimes and violations. It is easy to tell whether an offense is a crime or a violation. Conviction of a crime carries the possibility of imprisonment. Conviction of a violation does not. A bright line. If an offense is a crime, culpability is to be read in. If an offense is a mere violation, culpability need not be read in. Simple as that. There are further divisions within the category of crimes. Felony convictions expose the accused to more than a year in prison. Misdemeanor convictions up to but no more than a year. Federal felonies are all infamous crimes after staples. But Morissette leaves it unclear whether a given misdemeanor is a public welfare offense or an infamous crime. So it is also unclear what to make of culpability and defenses of ignorance and mistake. We balance factors on a statute by statute basis under Morissette. By contrast, under the model penal code, all misdemeanors are crimes. Culpability is, as a default, to be read into every criminal offense that lacks express culpability language, a bright line rule.